Welcome to History Comes Alive, the podcast that takes you on a deep dive into a new historical topic every episode. Join us as we explore the nuances of historical events you probably didn't learn about in school. Here's your host, Jeff Nichols. Welcome back. We left off last week just as the English and Scots were squaring off. Depending on who you talk to or who's allowed to frame the argument, either the Scots were treasonous or Charles had severely overstepped and underappreciated the Scottish religious conviction. When he tried to force the adoption of the common book of prayer, it did not go well. Like in England, Charles enjoyed the favor of the bishops, the high church, but he was tone deaf to the common people and their representatives. And that's our focus today. Now, I don't want to lose sight of what we're doing here. This is not a series on the English Civil War, per se. It's an overview on the reign of Charles I. So our goal is to develop the political background and landscape. We're not doing this so much to understand English history, although we'll certainly consider it, but rather to more completely develop English colonial North America, specifically the New England Puritan colonies. It was their fellow Puritans who were causing all the problems from Charles's point of view. And many men who had interests on both sides of the Atlantic were intimately involved. The ramifications for New England would be big. They would ultimately both directly participate in some pretty important episodes and then ultimately pay a political price upon restoration. So the politics is important. So much of history that we learn about is not necessarily actions of men. Well, they are, but not the impetus. They're rather reactions. We see the results of policies as they play out. But what about those policies, those rules behind the scenes, moving things along, the invisible hands of government, the provocative programs, the first causes that manifest themselves in reactions? In the U.S., we had the State of the Union Address this week, 2022. It was Joe Biden's first. We could talk about the specific things he said. But for this example, it's more important to point out that, like every other president, He made bold claims about successes without details. He called on industry to act in the best interest of the people. He put forth a wish list of agenda items that he wanted to accomplish. Oddly, that list very much mirrors and parallels what everybody wants. So first of all, that's going to be impossible. Pie in the sky. But The point here is that President Biden made a host of claims and listed a bunch of goals and solutions to problems that are not realistic. That is to say, those things won't happen in the current political climate. I mean, there are actual policies that have created most of the problems that he said he wanted to solve. Business acts a certain way according to policy. President Biden knows that, but he spoke like I didn't. For example, we're buying oil from Russia and other enemies, quote unquote, but won't produce our own. It's very disingenuous to say he's trying everything he can to solve the problem. Bullshit. He emphatically called for the funding of the police. And yet his party, well-documented, has been calling for the defunding of police for a couple of years. And there's probably a direct link to the spike in crime nationwide. I think everybody knows and feels that. Those are easy facts to measure the genuineness of his speech. Those are easy examples, indisputable. So he gets an hour or so to address the American people and seemingly does not anticipate the majority will understand those specific examples are policy, largely Joe Biden and the Democratic Party's policies. These are policy-driven crises. Now, I didn't give you a judgment call on whether their policies are good or bad. I'm merely pointing out that Joe Biden made statements that directly contradict the very policies he's actually initiated. I mean, sorry, Those were weak and misleading things to say, no matter what your political affiliation is. Insensitive and tone deaf, too. I mean, who's going to repay the misery and the terror to the victims of crime? Who will replace the lost finances for the skyrocketing cost of energy in America and around the world? Not Joe Biden, not any politician. Yet policy drives society, unless there's a revolt. So anyway... With this series, we're looking at the policies and the actions of Charles. We've reached a point where we could deviate from the script and begin to tackle the details of the various battles and independent civil wars that were going to take place, but we're not going to do that. 
we're going to continue to look at these years, the 1630s and 40s, through the lens of how Charles interacted with other leaders. I think it'll be fun. It's fun to me. It will definitely bring context to New England when we return there in just a few weeks. So we've got a pretty full plate today, today actually and next week. If we're successful, today we'll look at the opening salvos with Scotland and the ramifications of calling a parliament after 11 years, which will lead us into next week's conversation, which we could have done this week, but I think it would have been too long. There's too many moving parts here to focus on. But next week, we will get to the destruction of the Earl of Stratford, previously known as Wentworth, the Irish uprising and how it helped the opposition galvanize London. And then finally, we'll watch the chess game between Charles the first and John Pym that changed the course of English politics. So let's get to it. When we left off last week, the Scots were ready for a fight. Their champion was Alexander Leslie. He had distinguished himself fighting under Gustavus Adolphus in Europe. Charles did not have that level of pedigree at his disposal. The thing about the religious struggle in Scotland was that they believed that theirs was a righteous and a holy calling, right? I mean, they had been, they believed, the original converts to Christianity in the early fourth century, which would have predated England or Rome. So the emotions and the convictions on a national scale ran deep, deeper than Charles could have known, especially when his bishops gave him such bad advice. And it's odd because Charles actually was Scottish. The Scots wanted to keep Charles but they also wanted to keep their Presbyterianism, unvarnished Presbyterianism. Charles did not understand this at first. I mean, he should have, at least later, when the Duke of Hamilton, his lead advisor for Scotland, warned Charles to back off in 1638. Actually, Hamilton went farther. Prophetically, he told Charles that if he didn't back off, there would be trouble in all three kingdoms. That's exactly what he was going to get. So last week, we covered the affair at Greyfriars Church. And I've also seen this listed as Blackfriars Church. So something in the black or gray area church that erupted into a national referendum against the king's actions. In response, Hamilton organized what's known as a king's covenant and managed to secure 28,000 signatures nationwide. All this did was further divide the people from Charles. But I guess it probably encouraged Charles knowing that at least 28,000 people supported him. He must have figured there was more support than there actually was. Later in 1638 in Glasgow, the General Assembly voted to cut ties between the English government and their church. So you can see where this is going, right? Anyway, the Scottish Parliament met in August of 1639, and they met again in 1640 without the king's permission. They did not intend to offend Charles, but they did intend to mind their national interests. And you couldn't have both. I mean, sometimes in life, you really do have to do what's right for you, regardless of consequence. And those decisions can be tough if you know that there are unpleasant consequences. I'm not saying unintended consequences. I think everyone was well aware of how Charles would interpret their actions. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So anyway... During the winter of 1638 and 39, both sides prepared for whatever lay ahead. Charles had his advisors too, Laud and Strafford. Laud's the bishop and Strafford's the administrative political guy, the bishop and the politician, the mastermind behind the prayer book and the man who tamed Ireland. Well, not really, but that's coming later in the story. Like the Duke of Buckingham years earlier, they would prove to be less than competent advisors. So the preparations were being made on both sides. The problem Charles had was that he was broke. He had very limited resources. They did throw around a few ideas. Stratford suggested his Irish army. He had about 8,000 trained soldiers. Now, remember that suggestion because it will have some significance later, next week. Another thought was hiring Spanish mercenaries that may be used to encourage and to bolster the pro-Charles faction in Scotland. Those were the ideas that they considered that did not come to fruition. So the Scots had a huge advantage. On top of that, the Covenanters of Scotland had the support of the clergy. They aroused the masses. Anytime you can get a measured geography, an organized society to rally behind nationalism and religion, you've created a powerful union anywhere, anytime. 
The current crisis in the Ukraine has that feel. Well, at least there's an attempted feel. Vladimir Putin claimed a spiritual connection with the Ukrainian people. That's what he was going after, was this political and religious union. So the Covenanters had a commander in Leslie. They had a banker named William Dick, and the Dutch were supplying them with munitions. And they took the castles back from Charles. Remember, he had collected some of those castles. And by the spring of 1639, the Scots could brag 25 to 30,000 men in their army. Meanwhile, Charles had the reluctant Sir Edward Verney. His army was chock full of men who had to be pressed into service, and they had neither the will nor the training to fight. And what was coming was known as the Bishop's War. Well, anyway, the calling up of men to armed service was supposed to be for national defense. The problem is the Scots had not said they were going to invade. So, like so many other moves that Charles had made, was this impressment even legal? The contrast is stark. While it seems the whole of Scotland was motivated and unified, nobody was united in England. The disunity was so potent that Charles demanded an oath of loyalty. It's just one more overreach on his part, one more self-deceptive tool as well. Many refused. Men of renown, like our old friends Viscount Say and Seal and Lord Brooke, you know, the guys that were behind Saybrook Colony in Connecticut. Well, anyways, those guys were thrown into prison and then they were celebrated by the masses. So with all this drama, Verney led his army northward. So here's a question. Are you counting all the missteps here? It's almost hard to keep up with how many missteps, in hindsight, Charles was actually making. Verney entered Scotland at Kelso. So he invaded Scotland, and it all fell apart pretty quickly. It was May of 1639, and Verney's group was surprised by a Scottish army that appeared small at first. But as they prepared for battle, the Scots seemed to multiply. They were a full-fledged fighting force with dragoons, pikesmen, horses. The English understood exactly what they were facing, so they retreated. And Charles was beginning to understand what he was up against. Meanwhile, the Scots themselves still didn't feel like rebels. So there was a meeting set for June at Berwick-on-Tweed. And on the outside, it seemed reasonably successful. The Scots agreed to give the castles back. And Charles, who was there actually on site, saw firsthand the anger of the nobles. And he agreed to call a parliament in 1639 and a general council in 1640. He covered the national political and ecclesiastical scene with those decisions. And he agreed to the dissolution of the episcopacy as well. I mean, that's a biggie. I mean, frankly, to me, if I was there, knowing how hard he had pushed for this, knowing that this was one of those centerpieces he wanted was the unification of Protestantism in the realm. To me, that would have been a red herring. It was a red herring. The assembly at Glasgow was ignored at the time, except that Charles made sure that all sides understood that a general assembly should be called to cancel the Glasgow Agreement. So this was the pacification of Berwick, but everybody knew this was just a ploy by Charles. He was buying time. And that's another bad idea. Because when the Scots confirmed this, they were madder than ever. So, as agreed, Parliament was called in the summer of 1639. And they quickly agreed that the King's Privy Council should answer to them. The King's appointments should be based on their recommendations. And there were other actions, but you get the idea. Now, Hamilton, remember, he's Charles's guy there in Scotland. His job was not easy at this point. When Parliament recessed until the following year, they left a remnant to represent the government. All this disregard for the people seems eerily familiar to me. I mean, how about you? The missteps, the continuation toward a very unpopular goal that could have been let go, that should have been let go. The general Scottish population was not happy with these decisions. They would rather have defeated Charles on the battlefield. And you got to figure, these guys are only like 40 years into their union with England. Even this scenario seems eerily familiar to our contemporary times. The people were unhappy. They felt depressed. And the reality is the people will support the guy who rises up to challenge the authoritarian rule, what's perceived as authoritarian rule, only to find that they capitulate. Anyway, while the English had considered the Spanish, the Scots considered enlisting the French. Scotland had had ties with France before, remember. Even though they were now Protestant, 
and Catholic states, respectively. They had been brought back together on the continent against the Austro-Spanish forces. So Charles understood the game that was being played. Scotland was, in his mind, undermining him at home and abroad. His ego would not let that go. The problem was the same problem that he always had, money. How can you raise an army without proper funding? He'd need a parliament for that. So Wentworth was advising Charles. The Lord Deputy of Ireland had done a complete about-face. Remember, he had been a vocal critic of Charles in the 20s. Now, he optimized autocratic rule. He tamed Ireland through brute force and intimidation. It was orderly, if not loyal. He had investigated his enemies there. He had confiscated their land. He had imprisoned them. And he did have that Irish army. His success had come with a cost that would rear its head in just a little while. But Charles was listening to him now about the current situation. And of course, Scotland was very different than Ireland. His advice was to call a parliament. He figured, Stratford that is, Wentworth, he figured that the national emergency would unite the country. The Scottish threat would make parliament manageable. And he was wrong. And here's where all the previous missteps And those yet to come begin to really compound, to really cement the fate of Charles and all the people of the three kingdoms. We begin to move quickly toward the downfall of a king and the permanent remaking of English politics. I think good for the people, but bad for the monarchy. And it did not have to be this way. Anyway, as a demonstration of his authority, Wentworth called an Irish parliament in March of 1640. With the help of the English voting bloc that had been transplanted to Ireland, he succeeded. And he figured he could raise an all-Irish Catholic army to challenge Scotland. He would not count on the Irish Protestants or the English transplants or the Scots of Ulster. Again, remember that. Wentworth was pushing for an all-Catholic army from Ireland. There was another advisor at this time, an Irish Catholic named Randall MacDonald, the Marquis of Antrim. He was influential in Ireland. So Charles had a measure of confidence. It would be a two-pronged approach in his mind. There would be an English Protestant army and an Irish Catholic army. Of course, when you think about it, the English army may not like the king and the Irish army may not be loyal. So there's that. But after 11 years, a parliament was called and it was April of 1640. And it was the beginning of the end. Charles was oblivious. He thought his personal rule had gone pretty good. He thought Parliament would focus on Scotland. He thought the rumors that Scotland had been talking with France would unite the Parliament to his cause. And boy, was he wrong. Since the last Parliament, the guys had been busy, those guys that had been basically banished. While they had been neglected in London, they had been experiencing success in local elections across the country. And when the new Parliament gathered, the House of Commons was filled with two-thirds pro-Parliament men. They had not forgotten the 11-year hiatus. They were not just thankful to be back. And the trouble with Scotland did not unite them. They began right where they had left off in 1629. Few changes in personnel. John Elliott, the man that Charles blamed for the Duke of Buckingham's assassination, we talked about that last week, he had died in prison. And he was a martyr for the cause. He was a headliner. But there were a lot of people that Parliament remembered at this time. For instance, there was one William Prynne who had criticized the masquerades, remember those great parties that Charles and Henrietta had thrown. And that enjoyed widespread appeal from both Protestants and Catholics. And for that, he had his ears cut off and was sentenced to life in prison. Plus, he was handed a 5,000 pound fine. Years later, he was trotted out when a pastor, Dr. Henry Burton, and a John Bastwick had their ears cut off. Now, if you're reading those names off in a session of parliament or in a podcast in 2022, maybe we just glibly walk right by or walk right through that passage. But Burton, it was remembered, preached as his head had bled. So they cut his ears off and he still stood up there publicly and preached. That's quite an image to rally around, the blood gushing from a religious man's head. And we also need to take this in context as a nation. These people were only a century past all those martyrdoms of the Tudor Reformation timeframe. I mean, so consider the national psyche here, what they're seeing. And then don't forget John Hampton, the guy who lost his case against Charles' questionable taxations, you know, a dozen years earlier. 
So this new parliament, these guys, they were far more grounded than the previous parliament. They were far more organized, far more prepared. And the sides were being picked. Men like Denzel Hollis, who had faced opposition in the election from Dudley Carlton, the son of the ambassador to The Hague. Well, he won his election, but in the process, he became radicalized. A true parliamentarian, and we'll see that more next week. And again, our old friends, Brooke and Say and Seal, were actively recruiting candidates. The Puritans had clout where it mattered. They connected with the larger society on things like education and business and politics, and they worked well together. So as I've mentioned, many of the influencers in New England were there. This is why we're doing this little side series. In addition to John Pym, Brooke and Say and Seal, there was Robert Rich, the Earl of Warwick. These men, of course, were the financiers of Saybrook and Providence Island and Massachusetts Bay. They were small in number, just a minority, but they had managed to build a strong coalition. This parliament assembled on April 13th, 1640. Now keep that date in mind, April 13th, 1640. And there was only about 25% of the old parliamentarians seated. But one of those would rise to the occasion, John Pym. Now, John Pym is worth a little introduction. He's going to be our main focus next week. Like the whole podcast next week will be about John Pym and what he did. He would turn out to be the architect of Parliament's victory over Charles. His legacy would include a system of taxation that would survive into the 19th century. He'd been a member of Parliament from 1621 until 1629, and then, you know, observed the hiatus. And then again, from 1640 through 1643 when he died. He had attended Oxford and Middle Temple Colleges. He was a lawyer. He was intelligent. He was methodical. He was brave. He played a little dirty. But originally, he actually, like a lot of these guys, had wanted to remain friendly to the crown. They just wanted their due rights in parliament. Anyways, he had held a position in the local exchequer. He despised Catholicism and Arminianism, which, you know, Bishop Laud was an Arminian. And he was a businessman and he was a good administrator. He was a treasurer for Providence Island and he was determined at that point to trade with the Spanish in America, whether the Spanish wanted to or not, right? He's either going to trade nicely or at the barrel of a gun. Well, remember that plan didn't go so well for Providence Island. Anyways, it's these same guys that would be in parliament and that had also been the challengers to Charles during the era of personal rule. It's these same guys that would turn the political tide. This small but effective little clique. Pym was the guy to organize opposition in parliament. After the short parliament was dissolved in May, and again, we're gonna go a little bit ahead here and then we'll tuck back. Pym had been involved in drafting the petition of 12 peers that demanded a parliament in August. The long parliament came to order in November of 1640 with much the same atmosphere. John Pym giving powerful speeches on the State of the Union, critical of the crown, with a pretty healthy mix of truth and sensationalism, innuendo, propaganda. But all of those antics are for next week. Pym would ultimately break the system, but it would be a real doozy. He was a showman. One contemporary put it this way, quote, He had observed the errors and the mistakes in government and knew well how to make them appear greater than they were. End quote. Does that sound familiar in our contemporary setting? Someone of the business and commercial class driving home the errors of the government for the common man? I mean, history is important. It gives context to the present. It can be a guide for observation and action. It trumps hyperbole. Never mind that phrase. It trumps hyperbole. I wrote that out and I, then I saw there's a depth to that. Anyways, just think of all the crap that we've covered on Charles. The questionable stuff. Maybe not even illegal, just offensive. I mean, he did other things that were pretty good too, but we've been focusing on his downfall. We've been looking at those things that just offended the people around him. I mean, everybody from all classes and all walks of life had at one time or another been a recipient of some kind of insult by Charles and his policies. Pym was about to exploit that. Before it was over, he would make very public the private affairs of government. He would turn to populism. He was very successful at turning the masses against the king, playing on their fears. But again, that's just a little later. Charles still did not seem to understand just how great the need was. When the parliament did not act the way he thought they should in April, April 13th, he dissolved it. 
It was May 5th. So they were only in session a couple of weeks. Charles already couldn't take it. It was going to be a long summer. The Scottish army was on the border and England was virtually defenseless. There were still a lot of people, Protestant and Catholic, that supported the country, if not Charles himself. And they did contribute to the national coffers, but that wasn't enough. And while Wentworth, or Stratford, was still offering to bring the Irish troops to England, the Scots crossed the border uncontested until they got to Tyne. And there they were confronted by another weak English army. But I want you to, again, there's one more note card to place close to the front of your brain on this one. We'll tackle this next week, but Wentworth wanted to bring those Catholic Irish troops in to England to defend against the Scots. How do you think the average Englishman would have interpreted that? Yeah, it didn't go well. We'll talk about that next week. The Scots recognized that they had benefited from the actions of Parliament. Now, there was a bit of standoff between the two sides for a while, until one morning, as legend has it, a lone Scottish cavalryman went to the river to water his horse, and he wandered a little too close to the English camp, and someone took a shot at him. Well, they took a shot, and they hit him. They wounded him. But that shot was answered by the whole of the Scottish cannon, and the English fled. Now, they claimed they didn't run for fear, but because they had not been paid. I mean, maybe, maybe they figured, you know, if I was getting paid, I'd stay and fight and get shot at, but I'm not getting paid, so I'm out of here. I mean, I can see that happening, right? I mean, I'll be in the army as long as it's not too taxing, but I'm not getting paid. But as soon as, you know, as soon as the army is necessary, I'm out. But of course, I can also see fear in an untrained army as well. So the Scots moved on to Newcastle, where they asked for provision. They did claim to be on the side of English liberty, which, frankly, I think they probably were. Then they reminded the folks that they could destroy the place. So the gates were opened and they got supplies. At this point, Charles recognized he needed a parliament, right? This This is the summer of 1640. That call would set in motion one of the most pivotal political chess matches in Western history. It would engulf all three kingdoms. Hamilton's prophecies were about to come true. Many men would be ruined. The public would be ginned up against the king by the salacious stories they would hear. All the king's dirty laundry would be publicly aired. The 1640s were not like today. The public was not pervy to these kinds of reports, these scandals. We can still ask the question if Charles was a good guy or a bad guy, but it does seem either way that he was tone deaf. He made a lot of mistakes along the way. I mean, you're bound to if you only look to have your ears tickled. He never seemed to learn. He never seemed to understand that his idea of his rule was not just unpopular, it wasn't possible. But the unraveling will take a little bit of time to unpack. And so we're gonna leave that for next time. But until then, I hope our time together this time has really helped the history to come alive. Thanks for listening to History Comes Alive. We hope today's episode has given you valuable new information and inspired you to dive even deeper. Don't forget to check out Jeff's website, historywithjeff.com, and engage with Jeff across all your favorite social media platforms at History with Jeff. Join us next time as more history comes alive.